In this lecture, we're going to introduce um, a very important uh, topic in number theory, an important tool uh, that we're going to use all the time, which is uh, modular arithmetic. So the, uh, the motivation behind modular arithmetic, before I even tell you what it is, I, I want to give you sort of some philosophy. So uh, the motivation is that uh, the structure of the integers, which is what we're trying to study, uh, with, in number theory. Uh, well, as we've seen, it's very complicated. It was complicated. Okay, you have this lattice, uh, multiplicative lattice of primes, and the way that the multiplicative structure and the additive structure interact is uh, it's horrendously complicated sometimes. Um, so rather than um, rather than considering uh, the whole thing, so the whole structure. Um, at once, so it's often useful. So it's useful to uh, to consider. Um, let's just say one, you know, one aspect at a time. Well, what, okay. What do I mean by one aspect. What I really mean is uh, divisibility by one specific number. So uh, let's look at an example. So for example, uh, we can we can just study the divisibility by let's say uh, uh, four. So what do I mean by that? So well, any integer is of one of the following forms. So it's either the form uh, 4n, so multiple of 4, or 4n plus 1, or 4n plus 2, or 4n plus 3, and that's it. I don't have to say 4n plus 4 because that's, that's, that's again going to be just of the form 4n. Okay. Um, by thinking about the integers in this way of fitting into one of these four classes, we can actually deduce um, some really interesting facts. So for example, here's an example of a fact. Um, the product of uh, you know, any two integers of the form, let's say 4n plus 3, uh, is of the form and plus one. Okay, so for example, three times seven is there the form four and plus three. That's twenty-one, which is the form four and plus one. But it doesn't matter which ones you pick. I can I can even pick a negative number. I haven't uh, dealt with those so much. So negative one is of the form four and plus three. It's three more than a multiple of four, which is negative four. Um, so negative one times let's say fifteen is going to be positive 15, um, uh, sorry, negative 15, <laughs> uh, which is one more than multiple of 4, so it's uh, so the form 4n plus 1. Okay, uh, why is this? Let me just remind you uh, why this fact is true. So how do we prove it? Well, we just take two arbitrary integers of the form 4n plus 3. So 4n plus 3 Let's call the second one for m plus 3. It might be a different integer. And we multiply them together. We get 16 and m plus 12, m plus 12n plus 9. And I mean, if we want, we can write this 9 as 8 plus 1. Because 8 is a multiple of 4. And this factor out of 4 from all of this first th this stuff here. So this factor out of 4. We get 4 times something. Um, plus that one at the end. So we get something in a form 4n plus 1. Okay. Um, so often what we want to do is is we want to sort of, we don't care about the specific numbers. Uh, we might want to ignore what the specific numbers are and just keep track of you know properties that depend on their relation to 
multiples of a certain number. This is a fairly interesting uh, property. We, we use something like this when we prove that there are infinitely many primes of this form 4n plus 3. Um, so that's where modular arithmetic comes in. So what we're doing here, we're just considering all numbers as falling into one of these four classes, is we're sort of working modulo 4. So we're working modulo 4. This comes from the, the word modulus, a uh, Latin word which, which means essentially a, a measuring stick. Um, so we're just sort of measuring by you know, how, something of length 4, and, and that's all we care about, like where, where it fits on, in, this, in this picture here. Um, so let's introduce a notation. This notation is due to Gauss, mathematician. Um, the notation is, um, we're going to call new two numbers equal. I'm going to use a special equal sign. So let's say 7 and um, 15. Those are basically the same if we look modulo 4. They're both of the form 4 and plus 3. They're both the same distance away from a multiple of 4. Uh, they're, they're both 3 more than a multiple of 4, I, sh I should say, actually. Uh, so we say 7 is congruent to 15. Modulo 4, mod 4, put this in parentheses after the equation. So this is how you read it. You say 7 is congruent to 15 modulo 4, or mod 4. Um, and again, what does this mean? It means that these are both uh, equal, but you know, relative to a multiple of four, relative to this measuring stick of, of, of length four. So they're both three more than a multiple of four. They're both to the form four and plus three. Um, here's another example. So one is congruent to 29. That's true modulo four, but it's also true modulo seven. So one is congruent to four, 29 modulo seven. They're both one more than a multiple of seven. Um, this example actually reminds me of something. It reminds me of days of the week, right? So you have Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And let's say the first of the month falls on a Monday. We want to know what day does the 29th fall on? Well, um, they differ by a multiple of seven, right? So just count one, eight, 15, um, 22 and 29. So 29 is going to be the same day of the week as the first. That, that's, that's, that's what congruence modulo 7 means. It means you're, you're just keeping track of the day of the week. Because that 1 is not congruent to 30. So 1 is a Monday and 30 is a Tuesday. So they're not congruent modulo 7 at least. Okay, uh, so in general the general definition, we say uh, A is congruent to B modulo something, I'll call it M, so M is my measuring stick, if, well, if, they, if A and B have the same relationship to a multiple of N, M. So another way to say this is if, if, uh, if A and B differ by a multiple of M, kind of like this days of the week example. So it differ by a multiple of m. Uh, that is, a minus b is some multiple of m. So k times m for some k in the, the integers. OK. Um, yeah, so why, why is this useful? So, why is this useful? Turns out, this congruence here, so this sign here, well, it certainly looks like an equal sign. It's just one other line on it. Um, but that's for a good reason. So, so this behaves pretty much like an equal sign. It has a lot of the same properties as an equal sign, just in the norm, normal integers. Of course, this statement would be nonsense in the, in the, in the, in the usual integers. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so the first reason it's useful, so the first fact, 
is uh, this sort of triple equal sign, a congruence symbol, uh, let's say congruence modulo or something. So we pick some fixed modulus. Is uh, what we call an equivalence relation. It's a technical term. So equivalence relation. Um, yeah, so again, this is sort of a technical term that means we have uh, we have sort of three specific facts. So okay, what does this equivalence relation mean? It means um, that, you know, A is congruent to itself. Um, it's called a reflexive property. We also need, um, you know, if, so if A is congruent to B and uh, B is congruent, uh, so, sorry. If B is congruent to, if A is congruent to B, then B is congruent to A. Okay, this is a symmetric property. Let me write these uh, the names here. So reflexive, symmetric, um, and then finally, if uh, A is congruent to B and uh, B is congruent to something else, B is congruent to C, then uh, A is congruent to C. That's called transitive. Um, and this congruence actually satisfies all three of these properties. The equal sign uh, also, you might know, satisfies uh, these, these three properties. Um, let's prove one of them, just to get used to uh, this definition. So how do, you, how do we prove something like this? Well, uh, we, we just essentially write down a definition. So, so let's suppose A is congruent to B. So A is congruent to B means... It means what? It means that A and B, sorry, we should always have our modulus M. Usually in a problem with modular, like uh, in a modular arithmetic problem, we fix the modulus throughout the whole problem. So or just the whole thing that we're trying to do. We just fix the modulus. So uh, this means that A uh, minus B is some multiple of M. But then we know that B is congruent to C. This means um, B minus C is some multiple of m. It would be incorrect if I wrote k again, though, because it's not the same multiple, necessarily. Um, okay, what are we trying to prove? We're trying to prove a is congruent to c mod m. Um, okay, well, uh, how would we do that? We would prove that a minus c is a multiple of m. And I think I see maybe how I can do that. I can add these two equations together. If I add them, I get a minus c on the on the left. Notice these equations are just taking taking place in the normal integers. So when I have the equal sign, that's just taking place in the integers. Um, and then on the right side, I get km plus lm, but that is just uh, k plus l times m. So I proved that a minus c is a multiple of m. That means that a is congruent to c mod m. Okay, so we just proved that this is transitive, and you can try the other ones. Uh, this one follows, for example, because a minus b is multiple of m, and b minus a is going to be basically the same multiple of m with a negative sign on it. And k is allowed to be negative. Um, okay, so what's the big idea with an equivalence relation? Well, it's actually huge for us because an equivalence relation allows us to partition a set into equivalence classes. So an equivalence relation it partitions the set into equivalence classes. Uh, equivalence classes. This is essentially saying that uh, we can take the integers and then Every single integer we can we can sort of put into one of these one of these sets, and every integer will be, belong to exactly one of these sets. So here's a picture for mod four. I like to think of it as basically four buckets. So we have bucket uh, zero, let's say bucket one, bucket two, and bucket three over here. So we'll call this one zero. We'll call this one one. We'll call this one two. We'll call this one three. Okay, and then any any number, uh, let's say we have the number 12. Well, that's going to go into this, this bucket here. So if this is the mod 4 world. Uh, we're going to put 12 into this bucket. So there's a multiple of 4 along with 0. 
Um, where are we going to put 17? Well, 17 is one more than a multiple of 4, so is 1. So we'll put 17 in the same bucket as 1. 17 is congruent to 1, but it's not congruent to anything in the other buckets. Uh, 23, that's going to go to this bucket. How about negative 1? So negative 1 is 3 more than a multiple of 4, right? It's 1 less than a multiple of 4, but that's the same as 3 more. So I'll go in the same, same uh, class as three. And we call these equivalence classes or congruence classes. So these are, these are, when we use congruence, these are called congruence classes. Congruence classes. The buckets are the congruence classes. Okay. Um, notice we could have named this bucket, uh, so, so one is going to go into this bucket, of course, um, but we could have named this bucket 17 instead of one. It would have been just as good. Often we want to just use small numbers, so you know, 0, 1, 2, and 3 um, are sort of the best way to, well, I shouldn't say best way, but sort of, sort of the easiest way to call the four congruence classes. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's move on here. So I want to keep these, uh, these buckets here. Um, so, um, what can we do with this? So. Here's a second useful fact. And this one is huge, actually. So we can basically do arithmetic with the buckets, with the congruence classes. Okay, so uh, so so we can do. What do I mean? So we can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, not necessarily division. Um, but we couldn't really do division in the integers uh, anyway without moving outside the integers. Um, we can we can certainly do addition, subtraction, multiplication uh, on the the congruence classes. Or buckets, as I like to think of it. <laughs> um, just like we can on the integers. Just like we can in uh, the integers. Okay, so what do we mean by that? Well, what happens if I add uh, bucket one to bucket three? Often, so so I'm, I'm gonna actually gonna put a bar over these numbers just to indicate they're the buckets, um, not just the number one. So the number one does belong to bucket one, but a, a lot of other numbers do as well. Uh, so bucket one plus bucket three is, well, there's no bucket four, but four is congruent to zero, right? So four belongs to this one. So it's, uh, yeah, this is actually just bucket zero. Um, and here's the one we saw before. So if you do bucket three times bucket three, what is that? Well, the way you do this is you take any number you want from bucket three. I can take three itself if I want. Do three times three and I get nine. Nine is, uh, is in this bucket over here, right? So it's in this one. Is this one more than a multiple of four? Okay. So I'm doing arithmetic on the buckets. Um, this is all happening mod four. Okay, here's the problem with this. How do we know that we're always going to get the same answer, no matter what number we pick from each bucket? Right? Like, what if we had picked the 17 instead of the 1, and we had picked a negative 1 instead of the 3? Are we still going to get 0? Are we still going to get a multiple of 4? Um, and the answer is yes, and that's, that's the main reason that this is uh, that uh, modular arithmetic is just so useful, number 3. Um, sort of inherits the, the same operations uh, for, that, that the integers have. Um, but let's show that kind of carefully. So... Um, yeah, so, so let, me, uh, let me just write out that problem again. So, so wh what is the issue? So here's a possible issue. It turns out not to be an issue, but possible issue is uh, how do we know the answer if we're defining addition, subtraction, multiplication on the buckets? How do we know the answer to a uh, you know, plus, minus, or times problem? Doesn't depend. on uh, what 
number, what numbers uh, we choose. So what number is in the integers? Like what? If I pick the 17 to do my problem, is it going to give me the same answer as if I pick the 1 or the 9? Um, it will give the same answer, modulo 4. Let's prove that. So um, here's what we want to show. So let's start with addition. So um, here's the claim. If, uh, so we want to consider like maybe a sum a plus b. So let's say if a is uh, some number and then we maybe pick another number, c. So e and c are the same modulo m, but they could be different integers. And uh, let's say b and d are the same modulo m, but again, they could be different integers. Here's what, we, what the claim is. The claim is that if we do a plus b, it's going to be the same thing as c plus d at modulo m, right? So a plus b is going to be congruent to c plus d modulo m. This will essentially show that addition is well defined uh, for equivalence classes. Um, okay, uh, here's here's the proof. It's the same as what we did before. We just go from the definition. What does it? Let's use what we know. So, so what does it mean for a to be congruent to c? It means a minus c is a multiple of m. What does it mean for b to be congruent to d? It means b minus d is a multiple of m. Okay. I want to show that a plus b minus this is a multiple of m. So I'm just going to, I think, do exactly the same as I did before. So add these. What do I get? I get a plus b. These are just happening in z, in the integers. Uh, minus c minus d is, I can write minus c minus d is plus, uh, sorry, not like that. <laughs> um, I can write it as minus parentheses c plus d and then this side is going to be k plus l m so this is this thing here is a multiple of m which means a plus b is going to be congruent to c plus d mod m okay so addition is well defined um, subtraction is basically the same um, note that you know what what is to find subtraction we, we need uh, we need additive inverses. So what's the inverse of of one uh, modulo four? Well, it's actually three, right? Because <laughs> you get zero. But you can also think of three as as minus one. Right? Just, so the inverse of one is is minus one. It's just like in the uh, in the usual integers. And minus one belongs to this bucket three. So we could have actually picked any of these to be the inverse of one. The additive inverse. Um, so let's skip the multiplication. That's a bit trickier. So uh, here's a second claim. Uh, if uh, well, let's let's uh, have the same setup. So if a is congruent to c mod m, and b is congruent to d mod m, then here's the claim: uh, a b is congruent to c d. Um, did I do this right? Uh, yes. So A, B is congruent to C, D modulo M. Right, so if I want to do a multiplication problem, modulo M, and I do A, B, let's say A, uh, I can also write a different way, B can also write a different way. If I do the multiplication problem, I should get the same thing, modulo M at least. I might not get, get the same integer, but I'll get the same thing, modulo M. Uh, let's prove that as well. So how's this going to work? Well, again, we know a minus c is a multiple of m, b minus d is a multiple of m. We want to show that a, b minus c, d is a multiple of m. That's the, de that's by the definition of, of this. So, so that's what we want to show. Um, how do I do that? Uh, so, I want A, B to show up. I could try multiplying these together. I don't think that's going to work, though. Um, so maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll multiply this first one by B. So then I get A, B minus C, B. I'm allowed to do this, right? It's just in the usual integers. 
um, and then I have BKM, and then I'll multiply the second one by uh, by C. I want to see D to show up, so I'll do this one times C. Get BC minus uh, CD is equal to CLM. And now I think if I add these, I get what I want. So now I'll add these. What happens if I do that? I get A, B, so I'm adding these two equations. I get A, B minus C, D. These terms cancel. That's going to equal uh, B, K, M plus C, L, M. So we've shown that A, B, and C, D differ by this uh, rather complicated multiple of M. So we've shown this, so we're done. So we've shown that A, B is congruent to C, D mod M. A, B, and C, D differ by multiple of M. Okay, um, what, uh, what other properties do we have? Well, here's another property. So maybe I'll call this a corollary, actually. Corollary. Corollary is something that sort of follows, follows pretty directly from something we already proved. So corollary is um, if, uh, let's say, A is congruent to B mod M, then um, if we raise a to some power, we're going to get the same thing as b raised to that same power mod m. OK, why is this? Um, it's basically just doing this repeatedly. So if a is congruent to b um, mod m, we're multiplying both sides of this equation by first a. Um, uh, by A on this side and B on this side, well, A and B are congruent, right? And we just saw that if we multiply two things, which are both themselves congruent to the things on the other side, then we still get a true statement. So um, this essentially follows from the previous uh, claim and induction. Um, okay, so... Here's, um, here's a bit of a technical term, but um, we've basically shown that, so the, the integers modulo four form what's called a ring. I'm not gonna go, uh, go into much uh, detail here, but a ring is essentially something that, so I'll say it's something that has an addition a subtraction and a multiplication. And these have to sort of follow a bunch of properties, but so, yeah, the, the, the follow the, uh, let's say the usual properties, like a distributive property, so th things like this. Um, and this ring is called, uh, so, so this is, this ring is called Um, Z slash 4Z, and you read this Z mod 4Z, Z mod 4Z, or Z mod 4Z, but this is, this is, uh, this is mod, uh, the, the, the symbol, so Z mod 4Z. Um, this is the modern mathematical notation for the integers modulo four. And you should think of this object as just having four elements and there are the four buckets. We can add, subtract, multiply the buckets. In fact, next thing we want to do is make some uh, addition and multiplication tables. So here's addition in, uh, in Z mod 4Z. Okay. And then we'll do um, multiplication. So let's make another one over here. It's often the first thing we want to do, right, when we have a uh, new number system, figure out how things add and multiply. Um, and we're going to notice something rather strange. So let's start with the addition one. This one's actually not so strange. So in Z mod 4Z, we only have four, four, four things, four numbers. 
Um, zero plus zero is zero, zero plus one is one. We have two, three, so these ones are easy to fill out. One plus one is still two, one plus two is three. One plus three is four, but four belongs to the zero bucket, right? It's a multiple of four. Two plus one is three, two plus two is zero, <laughs> right? One plus three is zero. Three plus two is one, it's five, but five is congruent to one mod four. They're both one more in a multiple of four. And I'm only going to write these, these four um, elements. Uh, 2 plus 3 is 1, 3 plus 3 is 2. Okay. So that's addition. Let's do multiplication. Uh, so multiplication, 0 times any, uh, sorry, why did I put a 4 there? It's <laughs> a so 3. 0 times anything is still 0. So I can fill out a bunch of zeros here. 1 times 1 is 1, 1 times 2 is 2, 1 times 3 is 3, so 1 times anything is still that thing. Okay, this is where it starts to get weird. Two times two is four, but four is zero. So two times two is zero. I, I just want to point, uh, so this, this is weird. <laughs> this is weird. Why is it so weird? Because, you know, so two times two is congruent to zero mod four. That's what we're saying. So in this new number system, in Z mod four Z, um, we have, we're able to multiply together two numbers to get zero. Yet neither of our numbers is zero. So this is actually going against one property you might be familiar with in the integers. So that property is, um, well, here's the property, right? So if we have a product equaling zero, then one of the two numbers has to be zero. This is actually, you might think, a rather obvious property of the integers. But this is false. And Z mod 4Z. So this is false in Z mod 4Z. So if we're looking at this new number system, the integers modulo 4, we have to be very careful. Uh, there are properties that we're very familiar with from the integers that, that are no, no longer true. Um, but let's continue. So 2 times 3 is 6, but 6 is congruent to... So see how, I, see how I'm doing this? I'm doing 2 times 3 is 6. I'm just treating them like normal integers. And then at the end, I'm deciding which of these classes, which of these congruence classes 6 belongs to. And that will be the class of 2. This 6 is 2 more than multiple of 4. You can think of these numbers as the remainder, as how, how much uh, is left when you divide by 4. Uh, so this is 2. This one's also 2. It's the same problem. 3 times 3 is 1 mod 4. And uh, I also want to point out that this is rather weird. What is that saying? It's saying, yeah, well, we have it here, right? Two, two times three is two. Or it's congruent, yeah, it's congruent to two mod four. But what happens if we cancel the twos? We get this, we get three. What happens if we, we cancel the twos? We get three is congruent to one mod four. Which is false, right? Three and one are not the same mod four. So our equivalence relation partitioned them into separate buckets. We have the one bucket and the three bucket. They're not the same bucket. Um, that's false. So where do we go wrong? We went wrong by canceling the twos. We're not allowed to cancel the twos. So we're not allowed to divide by the twos. Um, Okay, so yeah, this is um, this is another weird thing. It turns out that this is actually related to this weirdness here. Um, so how are these related? Well, uh, if I take this equation and I move them over, I move this over to the other side. I get that this is congruent to zero mod four. Now I can do something I am allowed to do: factor out the two. That's sort of one of the usual properties. See. I, I should be more careful than saying usual property because uh, this is maybe something we consider a usual property, but it's false. Um, I just don't want to list out all the axioms for a ring, um, but you'll, you'll see those uh, in, a in a class in ring theory. Um, so we get this, right? Two times three minus one is congruent to zero, but that's saying two times two is congruent to zero. So you see that's exactly this up here. So th th these, are, these are both weird, but they're, they're related. 
Um, so yeah, uh, just be careful. You can't cancel. You can't cancel multiplicatively. You can't cancel fa common factors. Um, okay. Um, so I would really encourage you to try to make another table like this. So here's a problem. So make tables for z mod 5z. Integers modulo 5. You want to get as much practice as you can just doing the basic arithmetic here. Because it's a new number system that you might not be uh, familiar with. Um, okay, so I want I want to see a few examples now of how you actually use this this as a tool to solve problems in the in the integers. So um, before we go any deeper into modular arithmetic, and we will go pretty deep into modular arithmetic, um, but uh, let's look at an example. So so um, yeah, first of all, what is the remainder when say three to the fifty, huge number, was divided by four. Okay. Um, well, first it seems like there's no better way then just multiply this out, maybe use a computer, divide by four, see what we get in the end. Uh, it turns out there's a much better way. So, I mean, first of all, we, we know it's, it's not going to be zero because this is the prime factorization of this number, right? It's three to the 50th. This does not have any fours in it. It doesn't have any twos, right? We would we'd be looking for two, uh, two squared in the prime factorization if it were divisible by four. So it's not divisible by four, but what is it? Is it one mod four? Is it two mod four? Is it three mod four? Um, in other words, is it out of form four and plus one, four and plus two, four and plus three? So this question, what is the remainder when it's divided by four, i.e., what is, that's exactly the same as this question, three to the 50th mod four. What is three to the 50th mod four? Because what does mod four mean? Um, mod 4 means just ignore everything except its relation to a multiple of 4. So uh, this would be congruent to 1. If we're 1 more than a multiple of 4, that means we would have a remainder of 1 when divided by 4. So you can think of these numbers as the remainders when we divide by 4. Um, we just want to compute this. Well, how do we do this? So. I mean, 3 to the 50th is congruent to itself mod 4, but that's not so useful. We can actually um, do some tricks here. So here's one trick that we can do. So let's start by multiplying 3 times 1, 3, and we get 9. All right? So 3 to the 50th is actually the same as 9 to the 25, right? because it's 3 squared to the 25. This is just true in the usual integers. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to replace the 9 with something smaller. Because I'm working mod 4 now. So now I'm going into the mod 4 world. I'm going to replace the 9 with a 1. Why am I allowed to do that? Well, if I'm working mod 4, all I care about is... Um, all I care about is which of these four equivalence classes we're in. 9 is in the same class as 1. Let's replace the 9 with the 1. What's 1 to the 25? Well, that's just 1. <laughs> so we just proved that 3 to the 50th is congruent to 1 mod 4. What's the remainder when 3 to the 50th divided by 4? It's 1. Okay, so you, <laughs> that, that seems remarkably simple, right? Uh, compared to you know, multiplying this all out. I just want to point out, like, what are we really, what fact are we really using here? We're using this fact here. Okay. So if a and b are congruent mod m, then a to any power is the same as b to any power. 
So we replaced the nine. The, the nine is like my A. The one is my B here. Can I? I can just replace the nine by 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 a one because I'm I, A and B are congruent mod four. Uh, sorry, a and, these are congruent mod four. So I'm gonna get the same answer. Mod four at least, right? <laughs> I am certainly not saying that this is equal to one in the integers. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, but in the mod four world, nine is the same as one. Nine to the 25th is the same as one to the 25th. They're both one more than a multiple of four. Okay, so what if we wanted to do the same problem? Um, uh, so, uh, so what is, uh, what is the remainder when we divide three to the fiftieth by uh, by five, let's say. So what is this mod five? Another example. Well, uh, we do the same kind of thing. So I can just start multiplying. I can do three, nine, twenty-seven. I can take powers of three, but I'm noticing. Okay, my power is even. Let's use that same trick. So this is equal even in the integers to 9 to the 25th. What is 9 modulo 5? Well, it's not equal to 1. So 9 is uh, actually grown to 4 modulo 5. So modulo 5 and, and Z mod 5Z, we only have the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay, and everything else is equivalent to one of these. So this, this is congruent to 4 to 25. So we made it a little bit e easier by replacing a 9 with a 4. We can make it even easier. I can replace the 4 with a negative 1. 4 and negative 1 are both 4 more than a multiple of 5. These are congruent modulo 5. Why do I want to do that? Well, because this problem now becomes trivial. Plus negative 1 to the 25th. Uh, we have negative 1 to an odd power, so that's just going to be negative 1. Mod 5. And if we want, we can go back to one of these classes. So negative 1, congruent to 4. So I'm just sort of freely uh, substituting in other numbers that belong to the same bucket or the same congruence class. I'm allowed to do that as long as I continue working modulo 5. So there's, there's my answer. It's negative 1 or 4 mod 5. They're both the same number mod 5. Um, just to give you an, an idea how powerful this is, if uh, you're not already convinced, here's an earlier problem that we did. We did this back in lecture 2, I believe. Uh, prove that 4 to the n minus 1 is divisible by uh, three. And if you recall, the way we did this was with induction. So we used induction, which worked pretty well, uh, but um, it it kind of took a while, and it was it was a you know several lines of calculation. Modular arithmetic just makes this problem absolutely trivial. So, first of all, we have to let's translate this statement just like we did with the remainder up here. Let's translate this statement into modular arithmetic, and this is something that also takes a while to get used to. But what is this? What is, what kind of statement of modular arithmetic is this? So we're looking at divisibility by three. That tells me I want to look mod three. And what is it, what would it mean that this is divisible by three? That would mean that we want to show. We want to show that 4n minus 1 is 0 mod 3. It's congruent to 0 mod 3. Okay. 0 means if I'm 0 mod 3, I am a multiple of 3. Right? Not one more or two more. I'm, I'm exactly a multiple of 3. So that's what we want to show. How do we show it? We go mod 3. 4n minus 1 is congruent to, I can replace that 4 with the 1. 1n minus 1, because I'm working mod 3. I'll put a mod 3 over here at the end, just to remind us. Um, 1 to the n is 1. <laughs> 1 minus 1 is 0. 
I'm done, right? <laughs> so I just showed that for any n, this is divisible by three using modular arithmetic. Okay, um, let's do a slightly more complicated example. So let's look at squares, modulo, modulo eight. So we're gonna look mod eight. We haven't looked mod eight yet. Let's look at all the possible squares I can get. So what do I mean? I'm gonna take, um, I'm gonna just take uh, you know zero. Uh, zero squared is uh, congruent to zero. Working in mod eight now. I only have eight numbers in the mod in z mod eight z. One squared is congruent to one. Two squared is congruent to four. Three squared is congruent to nine. But nine I can replace by a one if I want. So I'm labeling my equivalence classes just one through eight. 4 squared is congruent to 16, but 16 is a multiple of 8, so that's 0. 5 squared is congruent to 25, but 25 is 1 more than a multiple of 8, so that's 1. 6 squared is congruent to 4, and 7 squared is congruent to 1. Okay. Why am I not doing 8 squared? Because that's 8 is, is congruent to 0, so this wraps around again. Here's what I'm getting. These are the square numbers in my modulo 8 system. These are the squares in z mod 8z. So any square is congruent to 0, 1, or 4 mod 8. Those are the only possibilities. And I'm talking about even squares in the integer. So take any square in the integer. For example, 17 squared. That's 289 the integers. But what is 289 mod 8? Well, the claim is it's, it's 1 mod 8 because 17 is congruent to 1 mod 8. So 17 is squared is the same as 1 squared, which is congruent to 1. So it's congruent to 1 mod 8. So squares are either 0, 1, or 4 mod 8. There are no other possibilities. This is really useful. So uh, we essentially just reproved, first of all, one other thing from a previous lecture, which is that any odd square is one more than a multiple of eight. Well, look here. Here are my odd squares. <laughs> and then nine squared nine is the same as one. So these, these, these equivalence classes represent all the odd numbers, one, three, five, and seven. And when I square them, I'm just getting one every time. So that's the proof. <laughs> any odd square is one more in a multiple of eight. And we can actually do some pretty sophisticated things with this. So I'll show you one more thing before I uh, end the lecture. So this is, um, well, normally when I think of sophisticated things in number theory, I think of Diophantine equations. So let's look at a Diophantine equation. So these Diophantine equations can, can get very, very complicated. Um, so let's prove that, um, this equation, x squared plus y squared plus z squared, it's a three variable Diophantine equation, equals, uh, let's say, 103. Let's prove that this has no integer solutions. So I'm not even in the modular arithmetic world. I'm just thinking normal integers. But it turns out we're going to use modular arithmetic as a tool to solve this problem. This would normally be a rather complicated problem. I mean, technically we can brute force it, right? We can, oh, these squares are always positive. So we can just try a bunch of integers and see if we, like smaller integers, and see if we can ever get 103. But we have to make sure to check everything, uh, which would take quite a lot of time. So uh, there's a better idea. The idea is to use the previous pattern here that we notice. The idea is actually to look at this equation. Look at this equation. Mod 8. Modulo 8. How do I know to look modulo 8? <laughs> well, uh, that comes from experience a bit. Um, but 
it's often a it's often sort of a best prime or a best uh, a best number to look. Uh, eight is not a prime, but and uh, when we have something with squares, often modulo eight or modulo four is uh, is something really useful to look at. Um, okay, so what do I mean? Look at the equation modulo eight. You just take this equation and replace things with mod eight. So well, x, y, and z. They can, I don't know what those are, but one o three is congruent to. So put a congruent sign. Uh, let's see. One hundred is not a multiple of ninety eight. Ninety six is. So this is congruent. This is seven more than a multiple of eight. So it's congruent to seven. Put minus one also if I want, but I'll just put seven mod eight. Okay. And now let's think logically about this. So it is okay. So if I had a solution, if I had a solution in uh, the integers, in the integers, then I would have a solution mod 8. And have a solution is z mod 8z. Why is that? Well, if two things are equal in the integers, they're certainly equal when we go modulo anything we want. It's the reverse that's not going to be true, right? Like if you go all the way back here, 7 is congruent to 15 mod 4, but 7 is not equal to 15. But if I had two integers that are equal, 7 equals 7, and then I look modulo 4, yeah, of course those are still going to be equal because they're equal already in the integers. So if I had a solution to the integers, I'd have a solution mod 8. So I would have a solution to this equation. This equation does not have a solution. How do we know that? Well, I'm looking up here and I'm seeing that whatever x, y, and z are, x squared is going to be congruent to 0, 1, or 4. That's it. y squared is going to be congruent to 0, 1, or 4 mod 8. z squared is going to be congruent to 0, 1, or 4 mod 8. 7 is congruent to 7 mod 8. <laughs> now the question becomes, can I pick one thing from here, one thing from here, one thing from here, add them up, and get something congruent to 7 mod 8? And it turns out you can't. Let's say I pick a, f I definitely am going to need a 4 at least. So let's say I take a 4 from here. Well, if I take a 4 from here, um, these are not going to get me to, uh, I guess, I'm at 8 already. I'll need to get to 15 if I want to be congruent to 7, but I don't have enough. If I take the 4 and a 1, then I'm at 5, but I'm not going to be able to get to 7. I would want a plus 2, but a 2 is not a square. So I'm only allowed to choose things from this set. Um, and, and you know you can just check you can go through all the possibilities and there's just no way to add together three things and get a seven if it were a six instead I could do it right I could do four a one and a one and four plus one plus one would be six um, but I can never get that seven okay so there's no way there's no way to choose these. Uh, there's no way to choose these uh, to some to something congruent to 7. It doesn't have to be 7 exactly, but something congruent to 7. Uh, mod 8. What does that mean? There's no solution mod 8. There's no solution to the Stifenti equation mod 8. But if I had a solution in the integers, I would have a solution mod 8. So if there's no solution mod 8, I could not have had a solution in the integers. So in other words, it's the contrapositive of the statement. Right? If there's no solution mod 8, that means there's no solution in the integers. Because if there were a solution in the integers, then I would have a solution mod 8. It's just you just take the same solution. And this type of uh, this type of logic here, and choosing uh, choosing the right modulus to sort of um, you know, limit the problem uh, in a way that you, you sort of get you get a lot of clarity from from looking at the problem this way. Um, but uh, 
yeah, essentially this, this is a very common method uh, in the study of Diophantine equations. And we're going to see this uh, more often when we, you know, when we get into the study of Diophantine equations proper near the end of the course. Um, so this equation does not have any integer solutions. Um, okay, so that's it for this lecture. Um, there are going to be several more lectures dealing with modular arithmetic coming up. Um, right. Thanks for watching.